uh, still on its way to orbit after a uh, successful uh, ascent up through main engine cutoff. Project, nice to be in orbit. called natural satellites come in many shapes, sizes, and types. They're generally solid bodies and few have atmospheres. Most of the planetary moons probably formed from the disks of gas and dust circulating around planets in the early solar system. There are hundreds of moons in our solar system. Even a few asteroids have been found to have small companion moons. Moons that begin with a letter and a year are considered provisional moons. They'll be given a proper name when their discoveries are confirmed by additional observations. Of the terrestrial, rocky planets of the inner solar system, neither Mercury nor Venus have any moons at all. Earth has one, and Mars has two small moons. In the outer solar system, the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn and the ice giants Uranus and Neptune have dozens of moons. As these planets grew in the early solar system, they were able to capture smaller objects with their large gravitational fields. Lapidus. Giovanni Cassini discovered Lapidus on October 25, 1671. However, to astronomers, Lapidus appeared only as a dot whose brightness varied from brighter to fainter over the course of an orbit around Saturn. The Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 encounters in 1980 and 1981 validated Cassini's original observations and explanation with images showing the different reflectivity of Lapidus hemispheres. Lapidus has been called the yin and yang of the Saturn moons because its leading hemisphere has a reflectivity, or albedo, as dark as coal, albedo 0.03 to 0.05 with a slight reddish tinge, and its trailing hemisphere is much brighter at 0.5 to 0.6. Saturn's third largest moon, Lapidus has a mean radius of 457 miles, 736 kilometers, and a density only 1.2 times that of liquid water. It's been suggested that Lapidus, like Rhea, is three quarters ice and one quarter rock. Lapidus orbits at 2,213,000 miles, that's 3,561 kilometers from Saturn. The great distance from Saturn's tidal forces and from most of the other moons and ring particles has probably allowed the Lapidus surface to be largely unaffected by any melting episodes that could have caused some smoothing or resurfacing as on some of the moons closer to Saturn. However, despite the great distance, Saturn has tidally locked Lapidus. The moon always presents the same face toward Saturn. With its distant, inclined orbit, Lapidus is the only large moon from which there's a nice view of the rings of Saturn. As with some other Saturnian moons, Lapidus is in resonance with Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which orbits at 759,200 miles, 1,221,850 kilometers. That means the two objects speed up and slow down as they pass each other in a complex set of variations. However, Lapidus has a diameter less than a third of Titan's diameter, so Titan's rotation and orbit are affected much less than those of Lapidus. Giovanni Cassini observed the light-dark difference of this moon's surface when he discovered Lapidus in 1671. He noted that he could only see Lapidus on the west side of Saturn. He correctly concluded that Lapidus had one side much darker than the other side and that Lapidus was tidally locked with Saturn. Scientists have long wondered why one hemisphere of Lapidus is so dark in comparison to the other hemisphere, and in comparison to other surfaces in the Saturn system. Lapidus may be sweeping up particles from the more distant dark moon, Phoebe. If that is the darkening mechanism, it should be steadily renewing the dark surface because very few fresh bright craters are detected within the dark terrain. An alternate theory is that there might be ice volcanism distributing darker material to the surface. Volcano-like eruptions of hydrocarbons might form the dark surface, particularly after chemical reactions caused by solar radiation.
The September 2007 Cassini flyby of Lapidus showed that a third process, thermal segregation, is probably most responsible for Lapidus's dark hemisphere. Lapidus has a very slow rotation, longer than 79 days. Such a slow rotation means that the daily temperature cycling is very long, so long that the dark material can absorb heat from the sun and warm up. The dark material absorbs more heat than the bright icy material. The heating will cause any volatile or icy species within the dark material to sublime out and retreat to colder regions on Lapidus. This sublimation of volatiles causes the dark material to become even darker and causes neighboring bright cold regions to become even brighter. Lapidus may have experienced a possibly small influx of dark material from an external source which could have warmed up and triggered this thermal segregation process. The second most notable feature of Lapidus is its equatorial ridge, a chain of 6-mile, 10-kilometer high mountains girdling the moon's equator. On the anti-Saturnian side of Lapidus, the ridge appears to break up and distinct, partially bright mountains are observed. The Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 encounters provided the first knowledge of these mountains and they are informally referred to as the Voyager Mountains. There are two theories on to how the ridge formed. Some scientists think the ridge was formed at an earlier time when Lapidus rotated much faster than it does today. Others think the ridge is made up of material left from the collapse of a ring. How Lapidus Got Its Name John Herschel suggested that the moons of Saturn be associated with mythical brothers and sisters of Cronus. Cronus is the equivalent of the Roman god Saturn in Greek mythology. The name Lapidus comes from the Greek god or Titan Lapidus, who is the son of Uranus and Gaia, a brother to Cronus and the father of Atlas and Prometheus. As the father of Prometheus, the ancient Greeks regarded Lapidus as the father of the human race. Cassini referred to Lapidus as one of the four Sidera Lodicea, stars of Louis, after King Louis the 16th. The other three were Tethys, Dion, and Rhea. Other astronomers called Lapidus by its number in the order of moons discovered at the time. Phobos Phobos was discovered on August 17, 1877 by Asaph Hall, gouged and nearly shattered by a giant impact crater and beaten by thousands of meteorite impacts is on a collision course with Mars. Phobos is the larger of Mars's two moons and is 17 by 14 by 11 miles, 27 by 22 by 18 kilometers in diameter. It orbits Mars three times a day and is so close to the planet's surface that in some locations on Mars, it cannot always be seen. Phobos is nearing Mars at a rate of six feet, 1.8 meters every 100 years. At this rate, it will either crash into Mars in 500 million years or break up into a ring. Its most prominent feature is the 6-mile, 9.7-kilometer crater Stickney, its impact causing streak patterns across the moon's surface. Stickney was seen by Mars Global Surveyor to be filled with fine dust, with evidence of boulders sliding down its sloped surface. Phobos and Deimos appear to be composed of C-type rock, similar to blackish carbonaceous chondrite asteroids, Observations by Mars Global Surveyor indicate that the surface of this small body has been pounded into powder by eons of meteoroid impacts, some of which started landslides that left dark trails marking the steep slopes of giant craters. Measurements of the day and night sides of Phobos show such extreme temperature variations that the sunlit side of the moon rivals a pleasant winter day in Chicago. While only a few kilometers away on the dark side of the moon, the climate is much more harsh than a night in Antarctica. High temperatures for Phobos were measured at 25 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 4 degrees Celsius, and lows at 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and lows at negative 170 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 112 degrees Celsius. This intense heat loss is likely a result of the fine dust on Phobos' surface, which is unable to retain heat. Phobos has no atmosphere. It may be a captured asteroid, but some scientists show evidence that contradicts this theory. Hall named Mars' moons for the mythological sons of Ares, the Greek counterpart of the Roman god Mars. Phobos, whose name means fear or panic, is a brother of Deimos. Russia's Phobos Grunt mission would have studies Mars' moon, Phobos, as well as return soil samples to Earth in order to determine the origin and evolution of this moon. In addition to its own mission, Phobos Grunt also carried China's first interplanetary mission to Mars called Yinghao-1, 
Phobos Grunt was to be Russia's first interplanetary mission since the unsuccessful Mars 96 mission. After an 11-month voyage to Mars, Phobos Grunt was to begin probing Mars' magnetosphere and atmosphere. At this time, Phobos Grunt would have released China's Yinghao-1 orbiter into a near-equatorial elliptical orbit. Afterwards, Phobos Grunt was to release a lander on Phobos to collect 200 grams of rock and dust, as well as to make other experiments to study Phobos and its environment. The samples would then have been launched back to Earth in a sample return capsule for study. The spacecraft did not perform its scheduled burn to begin its trajectory to Mars, and both spacecraft were stranded in Earth orbit after communications failed. MIMAS MIMAS was discovered on September 17, 1789 by English astronomer William Herschel using his 40-foot reflector telescope. Ground-based astronomers could only see MIMAS as little more than a dot until Voyagers 1 and 2 imaged it in 1980. The Cassini spacecraft made several close approaches and provided detailed images of MIMAS. Less than 123 miles, 198 kilometers in mean radius, crater-covered MIMAS is the smallest and innermost of Saturn's major moons. It's not quite big enough to hold a round shape, so it's somewhat ovoid, with dimensions of 129 by 122 by 119 miles, 207 by 197 by 191 kilometers, respectively. Its low density suggests that it consists almost entirely of water, ice, which is the only substance ever detected on MIMAS. At a mean distance of just over 115,000 miles, 186,000 kilometers from the massive planet, MIMAS takes only 22 hours and 36 minutes to complete an orbit. MIMAS is tidally locked, keeps the same face towards Saturn as it flies around the planet, just as our moon does with Earth. Most of the MIMA surface is saturated with impact craters ranging in size from up to greater than 25 miles, 40 kilometers in diameter. However, the craters in the South Pole region of MIMAS are generally 12.4 miles, 20 kilometers in diameter or less. This suggests that some melting or other resurfacing process occurred there later than on the rest of the moon. Interestingly, the South Pole area of Enceladus appears to be the source of that moon's geysers. Its most distinguishing feature is a giant impact crater named Herschel after the moon's discoverer, which stretches a third of the way across the face of the moon, making it look like the Death Star from Star Wars. The Herschel crater is 80 miles, 130 kilometers across, one third of the diameter of the moon itself, with outer walls about three miles, five kilometers high, and a central peak 3.5 miles, six kilometers high. The impact that blasted this crater out of Mimas probably came close to breaking the moon apart. Shock waves from the Herschel impact may have caused the fractures, also called chasmata, on the opposite side of Mimas. That Mimas appears to be frozen solid is puzzling because Mimas is closer to Saturn and has a much more eccentric, elongated orbit than Enceladus, which should mean that Mimas has more tidal heating than Enceladus. Yet Enceladus displays geysers of water, which implies internal heat, while Mimas has one of the most heavily cratered surfaces in the solar system, which suggests a frozen surface that has persisted for enough time to preserve all those craters. This paradox has prompted the Mimas test, by which any theory that claims to explain the partially thawed out water of Enceladus must also explain the entirely frozen water of Mimas. The mythological Mimas was a giant who was killed by Mars in the war between the Titans and the gods of Olympus. Even after his death, Mimas' legs, which were serpents, hissed vengeance and sought to attack his killer. Mimas was named by John Herschel, the son of discoverer William Herschel, who explained his choice of names for the first seven of Saturn's moons to be discovered by writing, As Saturn devoured his children, his family could not be assembled round him so that the choice lay among his brothers and sisters, the Titans and Titanesses. Astronomers also refer to Mimas as Saturn I, based on its distance being the closest to Saturn. The International Astronomical Union now controls the official naming of astronomical bodies. On its recent close flyby of Mimas, the Cassini spacecraft found the Saturnian moon looking battered and bruised, with a surface that may be the most heavily cratered in the Saturn system. The August 2nd flyby of Saturn's Death Star Moon returned eye-catching images of its most distinctive feature, the spectacular 140-kilometer diameter, 
87 mile landslide filled Herschel Crater. Numerous rounded and worn out craters within the other craters and long grooves reminiscent of those seen on asteroids are also seen in the new images. The closest images show Mimas measuring 397 kilometers, 247 miles across, in the finest detail yet seen. One dramatic view, acquired near Cassini's closest approach, shows the moon against the backdrop of Saturn's rings. A false color composite image reveals a region in blue and red of presumably different composition or texture just west of, and perhaps related to, the Herschel crater. Scientists hope that the analysis of the image will tell them how many crater-causing impactors have coursed through the Saturn system, and where those objects might have come from. There's also the suspicion, yet to be investigated, that the grooves, first discovered by NASA's Voyager spacecraft but now seen up close, are related to the giant impact that caused the biggest crater of all, Herschel, on the opposite side of the moon. Io Jupiter's rocky moon, Io, is the most volcanically active world in the solar system, with hundreds of volcanoes, some erupting lava fountains dozens of miles or kilometers high. Io's remarkable activity is the result of a tug-of-war between Jupiter's powerful gravity and smaller but precisely timed poles from two neighboring moons that orbit farther from Jupiter, Europa and Ganymede. In mythology, Io is a mortal woman transformed into a cow during a dispute between the Greek god Zeus, Jupiter in Roman mythology, and his wife Hera, Juno to the Romans. Size and Distance a bit larger than Earth's moon, Io is the third largest of Jupiter's moons and the fifth one in distance from the planet. Orbit and Rotation Although Io always points to the same side toward Jupiter in its orbit around the giant planet, the large moons Europa and Ganymede perturb Io's orbit into an irregularly elliptical one. Thus, in its widely varying distances from Jupiter, Io is subjected to tremendous tidal forces. These forces cause Io's surface to bulge up and down, in or out, by as much as 330 feet, 100 meters. Compare these tides on Io's solid surface to the tides on Earth's oceans. On Earth, in the place where the tides are highest, the difference between low and high tides is only 60 feet, 18 meters, and this is for water, not solid ground. Io's orbit, keeping it at more or less a cozy 262,000 miles, 422,000 kilometers from Jupiter, cuts across the planet's powerful magnetic lines of force, thus turning Io into an electric generator. Io can develop 400,000 volts across itself and create an electric current of 3 million amperes. This current takes the path of least resistance among Jupiter's magnetic field lines to the planet's surfaces creating lightning in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. Surface The tidal forces generate a tremendous amount of heat within Io, keeping much of its subsurface crust in liquid form, seeking any available escape route to the surface to relieve the pressure. Thus, the surface of Io is constantly renewing itself, filling in any impact craters with molten lava lakes and spreading smooth new floodplains of liquid rock. The composition of this material is not yet entirely clear, but theories suggest that it's largely molten sulfur and its compounds, which would account for the varied coloring, or silicate rock, which would better account for the apparent temperatures which may be too hot to be sulfur. Sulfur dioxide is the primary constituent of a thin atmosphere on Io. It has no water to speak of, unlike the other colder Galilean moons. Data from the Galileo spacecraft indicates that an iron core may form Io's center, thus giving Io its own magnetic field. Constant volcanism and intense radiation make an unlikely destination for life. Magnetosphere As Jupiter rotates, it takes its magnetic field around with it, sweeping past Io and stripping off about one ton a thousand kilograms, of Io's material every second. This material becomes ionized in the magnetic field and forms a donut-shaped cloud of intense radiation referred to as a plasma torus. Some of the ions are pulled into Jupiter's atmosphere along the magnetic lines of force and create auroras in the planet's upper atmosphere. It is the ions escaping from this torus that inflate Jupiter's magnetosphere to over twice the size we would expect. Galileo Manuscript Draft of a letter to Leonardo Donato, Doge of Venice, August 1609, and notes on the moons of Jupiter, January 1610. 
Discovery. Io was discovered on January 8, 1610 by Galileo Galilei. The discovery, along with three other Jovian moons, was the first time a moon was discovered orbiting a planet other than Earth. The discovery of the four Galilean satellites eventually led to the understanding that planets in our solar system orbit the Sun instead of the solar system revolving around Earth. Galileo apparently had observed Io on January 7, 1610, but had been unable to differentiate between Io and Europa until the next night. Galileo originally called Jupiter's moons the Medicean planets after the powerful Italian Medici family, and referred to the individual moons numerically as 1, 2, 3, and 4. Galileo's naming system would be used for a couple of centuries. It wouldn't be until the mid-1800s that the names of the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto would be officially adopted and only after it became apparent that naming moons by number would be very confusing as new additional moons were being discovered. In mythology, Io is a mortal woman transformed into a cow during a marital dispute between the Greek god Zeus, Jupiter in Roman mythology, and his wife Juno. NASA's Juno mission is named in honor of Juno, who could peer through the clouds and expose her husband's wrongdoings. The spacecraft also peers through the clouds to reveal Jupiter's secrets. NASA's Galileo spacecraft caught Jupiter's moon, Io, the planet's third largest moon, undergoing a volcanic eruption. Locked in a perpetual tug of war between the imposing gravity of Jupiter and the smaller, consistent poles of its neighboring moons, Io's distorted orbit causes it to flex as it swoops around the gas giant. The stretching causes friction and intense heat in Io's interior, sparking massive eruptions across its surface. Callisto Callisto is Jupiter's second largest moon and the third largest moon in our solar system. It's about the same size as Mercury. In the past, some scientists thought of Callisto as a boring, ugly duckling moon and a hunk of rock and ice. That's because the crater-covered world didn't seem to have much going on. No active volcanoes or shifting tectonic plates. But data from NASA's Galileo spacecraft in the 1990s revealed Callisto may have a secret a salty ocean beneath its surface. That finding put the once seemingly dead moon on the list of worlds that could possibly harbor life. Callisto was discovered on January 7, 1610 by Italian scientist Galileo Galilei along with Jupiter's three other largest moons, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. Callisto is named for a woman turned into a bear by Zeus in Greek mythology. Zeus is identical to the Roman god Jupiter. Callisto is Jupiter's second largest moon after Ganymede and is the third largest moon in our solar system. It's almost as big as Mercury. Callisto's circumference at its equator is about 9,410 miles, 15,144 kilometers. Callisto orbits about 1,170,000 miles, 1,883,000 kilometers from Jupiter, and Jupiter orbits about 484 million miles, 787 million kilometers from our Sun. Callisto orbits about 1,170,000 miles, 1,883,000 kilometers from Jupiter, and it takes about 17 Earth days for Callisto to complete one orbit of Jupiter. Callisto is tidally locked with Jupiter, which means that the same side of Callisto is always facing Jupiter. Callisto is about 1.8 times farther from Jupiter than Ganymede, 2.8 times farther than Europa, and 4.5 times farther than Io. Jupiter's closest large moon, Jupiter, and its moons orbit about 484 million miles, 778 million kilometers from our Sun. So it takes the Jovian system, Jupiter, and all of its moons about 12 Earth years to complete one orbit of the Sun. Scientists think Callisto and Jupiter's other satellites formed in the disk of materials left over from Jupiter's formation. Callisto has an icy surface covered by craters of various shapes and sizes, including bowl-shaped craters and craters with multiple rings. Data gathered by the Galileo spacecraft indicate Callisto may have a subsurface ocean, and scientists estimate it may be 155 miles 250 kilometers below the surface. More recent research reveals that this ocean may be located deeper beneath the surface than previously thought or may not exist at all. If there is an ocean, it may be interacting with rocks giving Callisto a chance of supporting life. 
Callisto's interior may have layers of ice mixed with rock and metal, possibly extending to its center. Callisto's rocky, icy surface is the oldest and most heavily cratered in our solar system. The surface is about 4 billion years old, and it's been pummeled, likely by comets and asteroids. Because the impact craters are still visible, scientists think the moon has little geologic activity. There are no active volcanoes or tectonic shifting to erode the craters. Callisto looks like it's sprinkled with bright white dots that scientists think are the peaks of the craters capped with water ice. Scientists announced in 1999 that the Galileo spacecraft detected a very thin carbon dioxide exosphere, an extremely thin atmosphere, on Callisto during its observation in 1997. More recent research indicates Callisto also has oxygen and hydrogen in its exosphere. Callisto is on the list of possible places where life could exist in our solar system beyond Earth. Data gathered by the Galileo spacecraft and from models created by scientists indicate Callisto may have a salty ocean that's interacting with layers of rocks about 155 miles, 250 kilometers beneath the surface. Key conditions for creating life. Oxygen, another potential sign of life, has been detected in the exosphere. Bright scars on a darker surface testify to a long history of impacts on Jupiter's moon Callisto in this image of Callisto from NASA's Galileo spacecraft. The picture taken in May 2001 is the only complete global color image of Callisto obtained by Galileo, which has been orbiting Jupiter since December 1995. Of Jupiter's four largest moons, Callisto orbits furthest from the giant planet. Callisto's surface is uniformly cratered, but not uniform in color or brightness. Scientists believe the brighter areas are mainly ice and the darker areas are highly eroded, ice-poor material. Until now, we thought Callisto was a dead and boring moon, just a hunk of rock and ice, said Dr. Margaret Kivelson, space physics professor at UCLA and principal investigator for Galileo's magnetometer instrument, which measures magnetic fields around Jupiter and its moons. The new data certainly suggests that something is hidden below Callisto's surface, and that something may very well be a salty ocean. This premise was inspired by Galileo data indicating electrical currents flowing near Europa's surface caused changes in Europa's magnetic field. This seemed to fit nicely with other data supporting the idea that beneath Europa's icy crust, a liquid ocean might be serving as a conductor of electricity, said Kivelson. Armed with that information, Kivelson and UCLA colleagues Drs. Christian K. Karana, Raymond J. Walker, and Christopher T. Russell set out to test a similar theory about Callisto. Although it seemed far-fetched at the time, Kivelson said, the team went back and studied data obtained during Galileo's flyby of Callisto in November 1996 and June and September of 1997. Kivelson and her colleagues found signs that Callisto's magnetic field, like Europa's, is variable, which can be explained by the presence of varying electrical currents associated with Jupiter that flow near Callisto's surface. Their next challenge was to discover the source of the currents. Because Callisto's atmosphere is extremely tenuous and lacking in charged particles, it would not be sufficient to generate Callisto's magnetic field, nor would Callisto's icy crust be a good conductor. But there very well could be a layer of melted ice underneath, Kivelson said. If this liquid were salty like Earth's oceans, it could carry sufficient electrical currents to produce the magnetic field. Lending further credence to the premise of a subsurface ocean on Callisto, Galileo data showed that electrical currents were flowing in opposite directions at different times. This is a key signature consistent with the idea of a salty ocean, Karana added because it shows that Callisto's response, like Europa's, is synchronized with the effects of Jupiter's rotation. Although scientists consider the possible presence of an ocean on Europa as one factor hinting that life could have developed there at some point, it's doubtful that Callisto could harbor life, according to Galileo project scientist Dr. Torrance Johnson of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena, California. The basic ingredient for life, what we call prebiotic chemistry, are abundant in many solar system objects, such as comets, asteroids, and icy moons, Johnson explained. Biologists believe liquid water and energy are needed to actually support life, so it's exciting to find another place where we might have liquid water. But energy is another matter, and currently Callisto's ocean is only being heated by radioactive elements, 
whereas Europa has tidal energy as well from its greater proximity to Jupiter. Galileo flies by four more times between May and September of 1999, which may yield more clues about the possibility of a Callisto ocean. However, Kivelson said that scientists will rely heavily on theoretical models to test their interpretations about Callisto. Kivelson and her team are re-examining magnetometer data from Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, to address the tantalizing concept that Callisto and Europa may not be the only moons of Jupiter with subsurface oceans.